In this presentation, we are going to take a look at some items in the book of Matthew, chapters 21 through 23, and then probably one story from Luke, chapter 19. So with that in mind, and also I'd remind you to consider reading these chapters before so you're familiar with the story, because I won't necessarily go through the storyline on everything. On some things we read them, but on others we don't. So that is just something you may want to consider. So, first of all, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 7 through 13. This is where Jesus rides in triumph into Jerusalem, a famous part. And we're probably familiar with the story. He rides upon the colt of an ass. And people throw down their clothes and wave branches as he enters into the city. There is something important taught in here, and so we're going to read the verses, and let's take a look at a great principle. Starting with verse 7. And brought, and this is the apostles, and they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him, Christ, thereon. Verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Verse 9, And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so let's just stop right there for a minute because it's, what does Hosanna mean? It's a Hebrew word. What are they yelling out to him? I think is very significant in what he is going to do next. Hosanna means save us now, exclamation point. So that's what they're yelling out to him. Jesus of Nazareth, please save us now. So let's take a look at the rest of the story and let's see what he does after he comes in and they are yelling this. Because I don't think it's a coincidence where he goes and what he does. Verse 10, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, And Jesus went to the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Isn't that interesting? The very first place he goes to after they have yelled, save us now, is to the temple and to cleanse it so it could be a proper place of worship. I am suggesting that in this short little story, in this example, that Jesus is trying to tell us, if you want to be saved, then you need to make covenants and perform ordinances in temples of God. After a temple is dedicated, we do the Hosanna shout. Do you think that's just by accident? We are shouting, save us now, in the very building that has the covenants that can do that. Jesus goes and cleanses the temple. I think he's trying to send a message. In fact, let's take a look at what President Howard W. Hunter said in General Conference concerning the temple and the symbol of our membership. Listen carefully. President Hunter said, I invite the Latter-day Saints to look to the temple of the Lord as the great symbol of your membership. It is the deepest desire of my heart to have every member of the church worthy to enter the temple. It would please the Lord if every adult member would be worthy of and carry a current temple recommend. The things that we must do and not do to be worthy of a temple recommend are the very things that ensure we will be happy as individuals and as families. Continuing, President Hunter, let us be a temple attending people. Attend the temple as frequently as personal circumstances allow. Keep a picture of a temple in your home that your children may see it. Teach them about the purposes of the house of the Lord. 
have them plan from their earliest years to go there and to remain worthy of that blessing. If proximity to a temple does not allow frequent attendance, gather in the history of your family and prepare the names for the sacred ordinances performed only in the temple. This family research is essential to the work of temples, and blessings surely will come to those who do that work. So there's President Hunter plainly and in clear language telling us that we should make the temple the symbol of our worship. Just as I think he was, Christ was trying to tell the ancient people they needed to make the temple the symbol of their worship. And that's why he goes and cleans it for a fit abode for proper worship. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 20, Jesus curses a fig tree. It says in verse 18, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. you got to remember, Christ was part mortal, so he got hungry, he got tired. Same things that we do. Verse 19, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on this henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Even though that might, might not be the time of the new figs that were coming on, because there were leaves still on the tree, there should have still been figs from the previous season on the tree, and there was nothing there. So what you have is a tree that appears to have fruit, but in reality, inside there is no fruit. Well, brothers and sisters, we call that hypocrisy. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? The fig tree was a symbol of hypocrisy. It appeared to have had fruit, but had none. Well, what will happen to us? If we appear in appearance, we go to church, we're in front of people, we're at different functions, and we appear to live the gospel. But in our private lives, there is no fruit of the gospel in our lives. Well, we too will wither away and be cursed. Let's now take a look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where the Pharisees are questioning the Savior concerning what authority does he have to do these things, his miracles, his teachings, and all of this? Now, it's interesting they say, by what authority? They're not necessarily questioning that he doesn't have authority. And let's take a look at the difference and the meaning of what they're getting at here and what they're trying to accuse him of. This is Elder Bruce R. McConkie. He writes... And I apologize for the typo on the slide there for rights. He writes the following. It is noteworthy that his Jewish antagonists did not ask for a sign to prove that Jesus had authority. Such is the course they had followed when he cleansed the temple near the beginning of his ministry. Since then, his whole ministry was a witness that he did have authority. And even the day before, having again cleansed the temple, he had caused the lame to walk and the blind to see. The present inquiry was not to determine if Jesus had authority, for none could no longer dispute that. Rather, it was to show that he had not received a rabbinical commission as such, thus giving the Jews an excuse to accuse him of violating their laws and standards. So what they're asking is, which of the Pharisee schools have given you authority to preach the gospel? They knew he had some kind of authority. No one could do the miracles he did without having authority from God. He just didn't come from any of their schools of learning, which were full of faults, traditions, and standards. And so that is what they were asking him. And 
they cannot. He first says, I'll answer you if you'll answer me. John, did he have authority to do baptism? And they wouldn't answer that question because if they said, yes, John had authority, then he would say, well, then why didn't you go get baptized? And if they said, no, John didn't have authority, then the people would turn against him because the multitude of the people considered John a great prophet. And they said, we cannot tell. And so Christ says, well, then I cannot tell you whether what authority I have. In other words, they weren't going to listen. They knew he had authority to do these things. They were just trying to catch him and to show the people, look, look, we need to get rid of him. He never came from one of our special rabbinic schools. That's what they were trying to do. Such wicked and evil men. Okay, next is Matthew chapter 21, 33 through 41, and this is called the parable of the wicked husbandman. This is a parable, and we're going to read the whole thing, because I'm going to show you. This is where Jesus will show the Jews that the Jews will seek Jesus' life knowingly. They don't seek to get rid of him and kill him in darkness and in ignorance. No, they know he is the son of God. They know he is the heir and the heir of heavenly father and that they are still going to try to kill him because of their pride and try to get rid of him. And he tells them that I know you know who I am in a parable and it's this one. So starting with verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder, our heavenly father, which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged and winepressed it and built a tower, the temple, the vineyard would be the house of Israel, and led it out to husbandmen, the Jewish leaders, and went into a far country. Verse 34, and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. So he sends the servants who would be the prophets, go and see how they're doing if we're getting any fruit from the house of Israel. Well, verse 35, And the husbandmen, the Jewish leaders, took his servants, the prophets, and beat one and killed another and stoned another. The Old Testament is full of times when the Jewish leaders killed the prophets of God because they did not like what they were teaching. Verse 36, And again he sent other servants, more other prophets, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Now look at 37, But last of all, he sent them his son, that would be Jesus Christ, saying, Surely they'll reverence my son. I'll send him the very son of the householder, who owns the vineyard, who's in charge, and they'll reverence my son. See, this would be the son of God, the son of heavenly father. Verse 38, And when the husbandmen, the Jewish leaders, saw the son, Jesus Christ, they said among themselves, This is the heir. They know who he is. They know that Jesus Christ is the heir of Heavenly Father of God. And yet they say, come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. That's how prideful and wicked they were. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what shall he do unto these husbandmen? What will he do unto Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders? Verse 41, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. And he does. By 70 AD, there is the Roman wars against the Jews in Jerusalem. The Jewish wars. And blood just flows down the streets of Jerusalem because of the slaughter of the Jews by the Romans because the Jews rebel against the Romans and try to get their freedom. Continuing verse 41, And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. See, after a while they'll turn to the Gentiles, won't they? Paul, Peter, the apostles, because the Jews reject the gospel. And then in the latter days, the restoration, 
other husbandmen have come forth and are now running the house of Israel. So this parable shows clearly they knew he was the Christ. They knew he was the Son of God. But because of the wickedness and hard-heartedness and pride in their hearts, they still seek to destroy him. Now, in Matthew chapter 22, there's a famous parable in verses 1 through 14 called the parable of the marriage of the king's son. This is where a king has a son and he's going to get married and there's going to be a marriage feast and people are invited to that and you're supposed to wear a special garment when you go in that is provided for you and people are invited to the marriage commenting and giving insight on this is Elder David A. Bednar. So let's take a look at what he tells us about this parable. Again, you'll want to read the parable probably before you go through and listen to this so that you're familiar with when he makes comments, you'll know what he's referring to. Elder Bednar, after quoting Matthew 22, 1 through 5, he states, in ancient times, one of the most joyous occasions in Jewish life was a wedding celebration, an event that would span a week or even two. Such an event required extensive planning, and guests were informed far in advance, with a reminder sent on the opening day of the festivities. An invitation from a king to his subjects to a wedding such as this was essentially considered a command. Yet many of the bidden guests in this parable did not come. The refusal to attend the king's feast was a deliberate act of rebellion against the royal authority and a personal indig indignity against both the reigning sovereign and his son. The turning away by one man to his farm and by another to his business interests reflects their misguided priorities and total disregard of the king's will. Just to stop what Elder Bednar said for a minute, if you haven't caught, the king would be the father, the son, the son most likely Christ, and we're invited to this wedding of how the house of Israel is compared to the bride of Christ being the bridegroom, and how that relationship of the house of Israel and Christ is used symbolically as a wedding. And there are some people who will not attend meaning there are some people who will not keep the covenants and become members of the house of Israel. Or if they are, they will lose their membership in the house of Israel. Back to Elder Bednar. He says the parable continues. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants who went out to the highways and gathered together all, all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now back to Elder Bednar's commentary. The custom in those days was for the host of a wedding feast, in this parable the king, to provide garments for the wedding guests. Such wedding garments were simple, nondescript robes that all attendees wore. In this way, rank and station were eliminated, and everyone at the feast could mingle as equals. People invited from the highways to attend the wedding would not have had the time or means to procure appropriate attire in preparation for the event. Consequently, the king likely gave guests the royal garments from his own wardrobe. Everyone was given the opportunity to clothe themselves in the garments of royalty. As the king entered the wedding hall, he surveyed the audience and immediately noticed that one conspicuous guest was not wearing a wedding garment. The man was brought forward, and the king asked, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In essence, the king asked, Why are you not wearing a wedding garment, even though one was provided for you? The man obviously was not dressed properly for this special occasion, and the phrase, and he was speechless, indicates that the man was without excuse. 
Elder James E. Talmies provides this instructive commentary about the significance of the man's actions. That This is now quoting Elder Talmage. That the unrobed guest was guilty of neglect, intentional disrespect, or some more grievous offense is plain from the context. The king at first was graciously considerate, inquiring only as to how the man had entered without a wedding garment. Had the guest been able to explain his exceptional appearance, or had he any reasonable excuse to offer, he surely would have spoken, but we are told that he remained speechless. The king's summons had been freely extended to all whom his servants had found, but each of them had entered the royal palace by the door, and before reaching the banquet room in which the king would appear in person, each would be properly attired, but the deficient one by some means had entered by another way, and not having passed the attended sentinels at the portal, he was an intruder." A Christian author, John O. Reed, noted, this is now back to Elder Bednar, that the man's refusal to wear the wedding garment exemplified blatant disrespect for both the king and his son. He did not simply lack a wedding garment, rather he chose not to wear one. He rebelliously refused to dress appropriately for the occasion. The king's re reaction was swift and decisive. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, are we sometimes guilty of being rebellious in the kingdom? Of sometimes purposely not doing things just to show our open rebelliousness and our hard-heartedness and the pride of our hearts? Back to Elder Bednar. The king's judgment of the man is not based primarily upon the lack of a wedding garment, but that he was, in fact, determined not to wear one. The man desired the honor of attending the wedding feast, but did not want to follow the custom of the king. How many times do you see that in the church? There are many who want the blessings of the church and of the gospel, but they do not want to live the covenants that provide those blessings. Back to Elder Bednar. He wanted to do things his own way. His lack of proper dress revealed his inner rebellion against the king and his instructions. The parable then concludes with this penetrating scripture. For many are called, but few are chosen. Interestingly, Joseph Smith made the following adjustment to this verse from Matthew in his inspired translation of the Bible. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wherefore, all do not have on the wedding garment. Brothers and sisters, if we are going to attain exaltation, we must be clothed properly in the robes of righteousness, which can only be had within the temples. Back to President or Elder Bednar. The invitation to the wedding feast and the choice to partake in the feast are related but different. The invitation is to all men and women. An individual may even accept the invitation and sit down at the feast, yet not be chosen to partake because he or she does not have the appropriate wedding garment of converting faith in the Lord Jesus and his divine grace. Thus, we have both God's call and our individual response to that call, and many may be called, but few chosen. To be or to become chosen is not an exclusive status conferred upon us. Rather, you and I ultimately can choose to be chosen through the righteous exercise of our moral agency. Please note the use of the word chosen in the following familiar verses from the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. I believe the implication of these verses is quite straightforward. God does not have a list of favorites to which we must hope our names will someday be added. 
He does not limit the chosen to a restricted few. Instead, our hearts, our desires, our honoring of sacred gospel covenants and ordinances, our obedience to the commandments, and most importantly, the Savior's redeeming grace and mercy determine whether we are counted as one of God's chosen. In the busyness of our daily lives and in the commotion of the contemporary world in which we live, we may be distracted from the eternal things that matter the most by making pleasure, prosperity, popularity, and prominence our primary priorities. Our short-term preoccupation with the things of this world and the honors of men may lead us to forfeit our spiritual birthright for far less than a mess of pottage. So, brothers and sisters, it is entirely up to you and I whether we are chosen. That is up to us if we will heed the call and be obedient unto our Father in heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ. If you want to be one of the chosen few, then you must use your agency and do those things which will enable you to become chosen. It is up to us, brothers and sisters. In Matthew chapter 22, 41 through 46, Christ asked the Pharisees a very important question. What think ye of Christ? Let's read these verses and see what it teaches us. Verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Now that's a good question to ponder, brothers and sisters, to ourselves. What do we think of Christ? And then he asked them, Whose son is he? And they say unto him, The son of David, meaning he is from the lineage or from the line of the house of David. Verse 43, He, Christ, said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. You need to understand that at this time in Jewish history, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders have taught and believed in the tradition that the Messiah, the Christ, and the Son of God were two different people. They were not the same person. That the Christ could be one person and fulfill those things, and the Son of God somebody entirely different. But the Savior is now saying, well, how can that be? If the Christ is the Son of David, meaning comes to the lineage of David, why does David call him my Lord? See what he's saying? The only way that could happen is David understands that the Christ, the Messiah, is also the Lord. He is the Son of God. That's what he's trying to tell them. I am both the Messiah and the Son of God. That's why David calls me my Lord. Verse 45, if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? See, I am more than just of the lineage of David. I am more than just through the lineage of the kings of David and the Messiah. I am also the Son of God, the Lord over David. Verse 46, And no man was able to answer him a word. Well, of course not. They couldn't admit that he was the Son of God. That would have condemned them of everything that they against everything that they've been trying to do to get rid of him. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And so that's what those verses, brothers and sisters, it is important for us. What do you and I think of Christ? Because Elder Maxwell made this astute observation. He said, Finally, I testify that what a wise man wrote is true. If you have not chosen the kingdom of God first, it will in the end make no difference what you have chosen instead. What think ye of Christ? Does he come first in our lives? And if he doesn't, it really won't matter what does after that. He must come first. 
and we must give him first preeminence in everything. Well, in Matthew chapter 23, I'm sorry, 20, no, that should be chapter 23, verses 13 through 33. I apologize by the typo there. Um, Christ, let's, let's make sure that that's right, that Christ pronounces eight woes upon the Pharisees. Woe means deep sorrow or suffering. And so he says there are eight things they were doing or teaching that would cause deep sorrow and suffering in their lives. And this is important to us because it would also mean that if we're doing the same things, it is going to cause deep sorrow and suffering in our lives. Yes, that should be Matthew chapter 23. In fact, we'll change it right here. Matthew 23, verses 13 through 33. I am not going to read word for word these verses. I'm going to give you a summary of what each one means. So you can read them, and then here is a summary of the meaning of what he is saying. Number one, Matthew 23. These should all be 23. Matthew 23, 13. In fact, let's just go ahead and so there's no confusion. Here, we will change all of these. To 23. This happens when you don't proofread as well as you thought you did. Proofread everything. Okay. Now that will make more sense. So let's take a look at number one, Matthew 23, verse 13. Woe for rejecting Christ and the need for him and keeping others from coming unto him. That's what he was trying to say in that verse. Number two, Matthew 23, 14. Woe against oppressive hypocrisy and greediness. Boy, what does that tell you about the Pharisees and the scribes and some of the challenges that they had? Verse 3, because these are all directed at them. Because he'll say, woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. So this is, this is directed at them, and he's telling them these are the things they're doing that is going to cause their damnation. Number 3, Matthew twenty three fifteen, woe for converting souls to a false church. Number 4, Matthew 23, 16 through 22, Woe against moral blindness shown in the breaking of oaths. Number five, Matthew 23, 23 through 24. Woe against replacing eternal principles with religious trifles. Number six, Matthew 23, 25 through 26. Woe against hiding wickedness under a religious cloak. So on the outside, they appear to be righteous, but inside there is wickedness. Number seven, Matthew 23, 27 to 28. Woe against false outward appearance of righteousness. And so on the outside, they do all of the right things and say all the right words religiously, but inside in their private lives, they do not live the gospel. And then number eight, Matthew 23, 29 to 34. Woe against rejecting living prophets. We ought to study those brothers and sisters and consider how am I doing? Do any of those woes apply to me that I need to repent of so that I can avoid deep sorrow and suffering? Let's just take a look at one thing in Luke chapter 19. This is verses 1 through 10. A man named Zacchaeus, you may remember the story. He is small in stature. Christ is coming to his town. And of course, he is just thronged by people. And everyone is following Christ and they're all around him. And they're, everyone is trying to come to the Savior and be with him as Christ is walking to the, into this town. 
And so it's hard to see him. And we learn that Zacchaeus is very small in stature, or we would say he's short. And he couldn't see over the people, and he wanted to see the Savior. And so I put, instead of reading the verses, I think this picture says it all. The scriptures tell us that he climbed a tree, and then he was able to see the Savior. Now, that is significant because this would be a very undignified thing for a grown man to do. And he was probably heckled for it. He was probably scorned for it. He was probably looked down upon for doing this, but he still wanted to see the Son of God. And then Christ, as he's walking, looks up into the tree, sees Zacchaeus, and says, Zacchaeus, come down, because this day I am going to have supper with you in your house. And so Zacchaeus has the privilege of attending to the Savior and feeding him in his house. The principle I think that's important, brothers and sisters, is this. How far am I willing to go to see Jesus? Am I willing to read my scriptures daily? Am I willing to have my prayers daily? Am I willing to attend the temple as occasion permits? How far are you and I willing to go to see Christ? Zacchaeus, a grown man, was willing, even though he was probably laughed to scorn for it, was willing to climb a tree just to get a glimpse of the Son of God. How far are you and I willing to go? Will we keep our covenants at baptism and then later those we make in the temple? Well, that's up to you and me. How far will we go? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.